This is the 90 vote. 36 state houses and all 435 seats in the House of Representatives. From the voters tonight, some answers. Now reporting from ABC News World Headquarters in New York, Peter Jennings and David Brinkley. Good evening. Glad you could join us again. Welcome back. Nice to have you back, David. We couldn't do this without you. Of sure course no. not. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about an hour to go here this evening. We've got a lot to report about, so let's get uh, right to some of the information we have already by beginning in the Senate races this evening and look at some of the boards and some of the projections that we're already able to make in terms of the Senate races. No big change there this evening, but as I said, there are a couple of cliffhangers. Let's go to Massachusetts, first of all. We're in the Senate race there. John Kerry has stood off a fairly strong challenge from the Republican James Rappaport, the businessman, to hold his Senate seat and seek a second term. The issue up there was the economy in Massachusetts and taxes. In Maine, no competition whatsoever for Senator William Cohen, who has been seeking a third term. Here's an interesting one we'll be talking about in the next hour or so. Bill Bradley, Senator Bill Bradley, seeking a third term in New Jersey. That's the big surprise of the evening. Look at the challenge he receives from Christine Todd Whitman as of now. That is for us too close to call. We will talk about why. Four senators uncontested tonight, no competition for David Pryor of Arkansas. Sam Nunn in Georgia, Thad Cochran in Mississippi, or John Warner in Virginia. In the Michigan Senate race, the Democratic incumbent Carl Levin uh, has managed to stand off the Republican challenge there. The Republicans thought earlier on that Levin would be an easy target. He's seeking a third term and he holds it. Same was true in Illinois where the Republicans early on thought they could knock off Paul Simon with a widely respected congresswoman, Lynn Martin, who loses her seat in the House to run against him and loses in the Senate race. In Wyoming, no competition for Alan Simpson seeking a third term. His opponent, Kathy Helling, ran only on the uh, subject of abortion rights. In the Senate race in Kentucky, that was one the experts watched to see whether it would be a turnover. Republican incumbent Senator Mitch McConnell seeking a second term holds off the challenge from his Democratic opponent. In North Carolina, too, now, a race that everybody's been watching all through the race, we are now in a position of projecting that Senator Jesse Helms has held his seat in North Carolina against the challenge from Harvey Gantt. This is the race which has had more national attention than a great many others. And we are all the networks now sharing the same information, and that is the projection we can now make in that Senate race. Senator Jesse Helms will return. What about the governor, David? Peter, the governors are more important than they usually are in a year when the census is taken because it means a great many uh, congressional districts will be moved from state to state. And the governors will supervise these di new districts, and some of them will be shaped by uh, gerrymandered so as to benefit the party in power. Some of them wind up in all sorts of funny shapes. Sometimes they look like a tarantula peeling a banana or something like that. So I would like to run through the governors we have at the moment, beginning in Florida. Bob Martinez, the governor seeking re-election, lost. Lawton Childs, who served three terms in the U.S. Senate, went home, ran for governor, and won. In New York, this is no startling surprise, Governor Mario Cuomo has won re-election in New York. The talk now is not about New York's governorship, but about the presidency and will he run for it next time. In Ohio, Governor Richard Celeste retired because the law doesn't allow him to run again. He is being replaced by a Republican, which is a gain for that party. George Wynovich, who has been mayor of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, replaces Celeste. In Kansas, Joan Finney, in another gain for the Democrats, has defeated Mike Hayden, the incumbent governor seeking re-election and not getting it. In Connecticut, Governor William O'Neill retired. Bruce Morrison lost to jo John Rowland, John Rowland, you may remember, got some attention some years ago by smashing up a Japanese radio on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Didn't do him much good. All radios <laughs> not made in Japan. But anyway, Lowell Weicker is the winner, and he is now an independent. Lowell Weicker in Connecticut. Big comeback for him this year, yeah, personal he, as well as political. He served 18 years in the Senate, went home, didn't like private life, ran for governor, and he's won. In Rhode Island, Governor Edward DePreet has been defeated by Bruce Sundland, who has run against him three times. This time, he won. In Texas, too close to call. 
That's Ann Richards and Clayton Williams still battling it out right down to the last vote, which is yet to be counted, and we can't tell yet who's going to win. In Illinois, Governor James Thompson retired. There is a contest also too close to call between Neil Hartigan and Jim Edgar. Peter? That's an interesting one in Illinois because it brings up the tax reversal here. Here's the Democrat who's running against the tax increase or in supporting the tax increase on education and the Republican running against. So it's uh, another one we can talk about this evening. We're now going to call, too, that in the New Jersey race, which we talked about for a second there, we now project that Senator Bill Bradley will hold his seat, but he's had a real scare this evening. Uh, and Christine yeah, talked talk about now in the House and the Senate and the governor's race and the propositions tonight, but I think we have to move right to North Carolina very quickly. You got some first impressions of the yeah, Helms I have, victory? I have. Um, Gantz said, and I think he's right, that, Je that Jesse Helms always has something to terrify us with. It used to be communism. Now that they've collapsed, he says he is under assault by the, quote, powerful homosexual lobby. Mm -hmm. If there is such a lobby, I'm not familiar with it, but he used it in the campaign, and either that or something worked. He said that Harvey Gantt, the former mayor of Charlotte, had raised a lot of his money in the gay bars of New York and San Francisco. Let's take a quick look at what it looks like as of now. We are, of course, projecting Senator Helms is going to be re-elected for his fourth term, 64% of the precincts reporting. Our own Jeff Greenfield, who is in Washington tonight, has spent some time down in North Carolina recently. Jeff, your impressions then and now? I had thought that Harvey Gantt had a very good chance to win. I spent some time with Jesse Helms. His crowds were smaller than six years ago. My sense was that the fire and brimstone would not work, and I think I was wrong. The, the commercials that Jesse Helms put on toward the end, where he identified the so-called quota issue, uh, the Ted Kennedy quota bill that he said Harvey Gantt supported, Gantt supporters were sure that was a blatant racial appeal. Helms's defense was, no, I'm simply talking about affirmative action. But it's important to recognize that that was the most ideological race in the country. Jesse Helms, or Key Helms' supporters, every time he gets knocked by the establishment, every time he's the only man in the Senate fighting his own presidents on appointments, they love it because he's the man from the dispossessed country, rural country of North Carolina, standing up to the establishment big shots. And, here, and to them, they did believe that uh, the homosexual community, the artist communities were pouring millions of dollars in to defeat him. And, and I think Jesse pulled it out. And here's a case where negative campaigning appears to work. Lynn Sure has been looking at the exit polls from North Carolina. Lynn, give us a term election. On the other hand, as we said, there have been some cliffhangers, some people really threatened, not the least of whom was Senator Bill Bradley in New Jersey. You just heard some references to Newt Gingrich, who's been threatened somewhat in Georgia, though that race is far from over. And perhaps, David, the most interesting race of the evening in terms of change in the governors. Well, there are two, actually. They're interesting in, uh, partly because we, they're still too close to coal. We don't know who's going to win. In Massachusetts, all we know for certain is that Michael Dukakis will be leaving. Who will replace him, we can't say yet. There's John Silber, the Democrat, and William Weld, the Republican. And the vote at this time is very close, as you see, to 50-50. Too close to call. Another close race is in Texas, where, where the vote is also Richards 52% and Williams 48 We are waiting to get more returns before we, uh, before we can call that. If Williams loses, it'll be a loss in one way because his campaign is very entertaining. The other day he was talking to a group of voters and he said, you know to be a successful politician, you need to be a good salesman. You have to know how to persuade people. I, he said, was an insurance salesman. If you can persuade a Texan to give up his beer money to buy a life insurance policy so his wife, when he dies, his wife can live with another man in peace and comfort, you got to be a good salesman. <laughs> Peter, what do you got? It's, it's really proved in Texas this year that it really is a blood sport in Texas oh, because they that, that race really turned on a lot of things, but it began, among other things, to look a lot better for Richards when he refused to shake hands with her. And then when, of course, he didn't know what the only proposition was on the ballot which affected the powers of governor, and he voted in an absentee ballot. Michael Barone wanted to say something about the governor's races. Michael? Well, I think uh, one of the interesting things we're seeing tonight is that there's really a big tax revolt going on in the governor's races. We haven't seen a lot of change. I do, in, in fact, make in Iowa. We project uh, that the Democratic incumbent, uh, Senator Tom Harkin, uh, seeking a second term uh, more before this uh, election night. There was a lot of talk about this possibly being the lowest voter turnout in modern history. It hasn't worked out that way. It very nearly is. It's, what is it, 35%. 35% turnout and the lowest um, in recent years is, what, 33 point something? Yeah, 1942, 1926. Well, it's uh, very low. Yeah. 65% of the American people. But are you, here's what it looks like uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of trends from 62 on. Um, 
We had a lot of talk about that sort of uh, hanging around today. Um, George Will in Washington, give us your quick view on what low turnout means or doesn't mean. It means lots of things, but most of all, Peter, it means people want to vote when there's an interesting contest, and there aren't enough interesting contests. We come back to what Hal Bruno and Michael Barone were saying a moment ago about it being dangerous to be a governor, and they're quite right. You make decisions, the buck stops there, you raise taxes, responsibilities concentrated, but there's one other thing. Governors have opponents. A great many senators and congressmen don't. Four senators, a modern record, are running utterly unopposed this year. A number of others have opponents so unfinanced they're virtually unopposed. Seventy-four congressmen, unopposed this year. Three hundred and seventy-some, Peter, again with opponents with so little financing they're virtually unopposed. Who wants to vote? It was interesting to hear earlier tonight that in North Carolina at one point they had to keep the polls open in Durham, I think it was, because so many of Harvey Gantt's supporters wanted to get in, trying to make the difference down there. But we've already projected Senator Jesse Helms as winning the race in North Carolina. Senator Helms... Not Peter, but people here are still clinging to hope that when the ma uh, major metropolitan area vote is fully in, Charlotte and Durham, that perhaps by some miracle this uh, race could be turned around. But there's also the feeling that those who believe that way, uh, well, the, the, the wish may be father to the thought because the vote spread is just too wide right now. People here are anticipating a visit by Harvey Gantt very shortly, but they can't be happy with the prospect of what he's likely to say, which is a concession. But again, they are waiting for further returns from Charlotte and Durham and some other metropolitan areas uh, and clinging to some hope. Okay, all thanks very much. Let's go to the Senate where ABC's Jim Wooten is joining us. Or we haven't had you on yet, Jim, to have a chat with us so far. But take this question to start with. What does it take to beat an incumbent senator? Nobody's had much luck. Nobody's had any luck tonight. But uh, one of the things it probably takes is a larger turnout than you're getting. It also takes the kind of financing that most challengers don't have. In North Carolina, Jesse Helms raised and spent about $15 million to $5 million for Harvey Gantt. No matter what the voting demographics are in race and age and socioeconomics, if you're outspent two to one, it's awfully hard to win. And looking at a figure here, Jim, of 300... In Washington tonight, the former mayor of Washington, D.C., Marion Barry, has been defeated as he made a bid for an at-large city council seat. He came four in a race of eight. We'd like to have more time. We haven't got an awful lot yet. There are still some important races yet to call. Texas, we haven't been able to call too close. California is yet to come. A Senate race in Minnesota. Uh, before we have a look, uh, in closing, at a review of the Senate and governor's races as of now, some thoughts about what all this means for the future very quickly, starting with you, Ben Wattenberg. Well, I think the magic word is, uh, is California. Uh, th if, uh, on the assumption that that race is close, which it seems to be the Democrats in 1992 have to nominate uh, somebody from Dianne Feinstein or to her right. The Democrats cannot win in 1992 without carrying California. And the other thing is the so-called uh, rich-poor issue, the Kevin Phillips issue, uh, so-called, near as I can see it, has turned out to be a malarkey issue. Uh, it, it, it is not enough to carry, to, to give the Democrats that, that enormous uh, surge that some people uh, uh, said it might. Our own political director, Hal Bruno, we talked a little bit about reapportionment earlier. Hal, in terms of what those governor's races mean for the future. It looks like the Democrats are going to continue to dominate the state houses, which means next year they're going to have the upper hand in drawing the maps for the next 10 years. I'd also like to point out, Peter, very quick, fear of recession has played into de has helped Democrats tonight, uh, and that's an important issue. And one final caution, don't take the results of a midterm and try and project it two years ahead to a presidential. There's no connection between mm -hmm. a midterm and a presidential election. Okay, Michael Brown, you may want to say something more profound, but I very much like your view on negative campaign. Did they work this year or did people get turned off by them? Was it petty? Well, negative campaign depends on whether you make a charge that's credible or not. Some races, uh, Lynn Martin in Illinois, the Senate... Senator candidate. Howell Heflin on Republicans, Democrat Senator of Alabama, easily returned, said, the Gucci clothed, Mercedes driving, jacuzzi soaking, Perrier drinking, Aspen skiing Republicans. George Will, I, no offense intended, you're next with a final thought. <laughs> well, our viewers tonight, uh, as they watch into the evening, should watch two things. The three big states, Florida, Texas, California, will have 105 congressional districts. If one party gets all three, and only the Democrats can do it now, it will profoundly affect the shape of Congress. And it will lead, you were talking, Peter, a moment ago about how few incumbents are being turned out. 
in the state of California, if they pass the limit on terms for state office holders, there are going to be an awful lot of incumbents turned out and an awful lot of Americans watching what happens. It did pass, of course, in Colorado, George, where right. both at the uh, state level and at the national level, people want to put terms. Do you think that national one will be found unconstitutional or they'll I, be tested? I think it will. They're saying that states can set time, place, and manner of elections and that that comes under this. I think that's wrong. But uh, Oklahoma's already passed this at a state level, and it will be, I think, in four years, the dominant issue in the country. Okay, David. It is very curious that after a year of scandal, governmental failure, fearful events in Washington, we wound up with an election that is primarily concerned with abortion, money, and the exchange of insults. What was the worst insult you heard all year? Well, I'll give you one. He right. said of his opponent, he is one of the Senate's heaviest drinkers. You like that one? No, I couldn't hear you. The director was talking in my ear. Do you mind he giving it to me he again? Said, <laughs> he said, my opponent is one of the Senate's heaviest drinkers. That's supposed to be off, off, the, off the board for politeness, but that's what one member said about another. He also said he is rotten to the core, and it goes on. You want more? Well, Michael Perron did.